Thank you, everybody. Um, so I, maybe I'll introduce myself for a few minutes, and then maybe you have more of a dialogue here about what you're concerned about, and then I'll try to talk through any questions that you all might have. Does that sound like a pretty good program? So I'm, a, I'm Chris Kennedy. I'm one of Bobby and Ethel Kennedy's 11 children. And when I was in high school, my oldest brother, Joe Kennedy, he later became a US congressman, and his son is now a congressman. But the, the dad, my older brother, Joe Kennedy, started a not-for-profit oil company. I just lost like this whole part of, part, part of the room. So maybe I back up and explain how that works. So he was trying to help people who needed help heating their homes during the cold winters in Massachusetts. And he started what's now called a social business. Back then, they didn't know how to describe it. He started this not-for-profit oil company called Citizens Energy, and they would buy oil, send it to a refinery. Then he'd sell off gasoline and Vaseline and jet fuel and 30 other byproducts. He would take the profit on all of that, and he would pay for home heating oil, which was left over. And then he would take that home heating oil and distribute it to, well, people who needed help during, during that cold winter in, in Boston and all over Massachusetts. The, the program worked really well and spread to 28 states and continues operating today. And I thought, wow, he's figured out a way to like, bend the rules of the economy to make it work once again for everybody and not just the super rich. And I thought, I want to do what he's done. I, I want to live up to my parents' desire to have us all work for others community service of one form or another, but I didn't want to spend my whole time on the phone asking people for money and then trying to figure out a way to give it away. And I thought Joe had found the solution. And I had, I guess, what an alcoholic might describe as a moment of clarity. <laughs> and I, I knew, okay, I, I want to do what Joe's doing. And, and yet at the same time, this is probably by college, that I also knew that <clears throat> under no circumstances, there was no way I was ever going to work for my oldest brother. <laughs> Joe, Joe had these old uh, offices in Boston at a building called the Russia Wharf Building. It was a not-for-profit, so it was sort of an old beat-down building, and he was in there. And they had what are called hollow core doors. There are no hollow core doors in the Mart. It's really inexpensive uh, architecture, really. You, you just have a frame and put a thin strip of maybe eighth-inch laminate over the frame, and that's the door. And in, in the conference room at Citizens Energy, there was a hollow core door. And you could see where my oldest brother, Joe, had picked up another brother and thrown him into the wall, into the door, so hard that my other brother had dented the door with the back of his head, his shoulder blades, and, and his, his pelvis. And you could look at that. If your mind wandered while you were in this room, you'd look like, what, the, what is going on over there? And it, it was like the Shroud of Turin, <laughs> but like a really scary version. And I was like, yeah, I don't want to work for Joe. So J President Reagan was the president of the United States. I graduated uh, college in 86, and he was the president of the United States. He had done something no American president had ever done. He had created homelessness and hunger in the United States. Now, there was hunger and there was homelessness in the United States since the country was founded, but never caused by the president of the United States. That's a big statement. But if you look back at the history of food banking in America, almost every food bank in the United States was started during the Reagan administration. Most of you look like you're younger than I am. We didn't have homeless living in our cities like we did before the Reagan administration. We didn't have that. It was like a brand new problem. And like so many others who went in to battle President Reagan, I wanted to be part of that movement too. I wanted to help feed people. I wanted to do what my brother Joe had done, but I wanted to do it in food instead of in energy. But I didn't know how to feed anybody. So I thought I'd get a job in industry, work there for a few years, and then maybe start my own. I got a job in 1986. I moved from Boston, Massachusetts to Decatur, Illinois, to work for Archer Daniels Midland. And I lived in employee housing down in Decatur. And then they moved me all around the state to little grain elevators where I'd buy corn and soybeans from farmers. And and then they moved me to maybe a little bigger elevator, and I'd buy corn and soybeans from the sort of elevator I'd been at the week before. And then, then I went to a railhead and traded a barge freight along the Mississippi River. I worked at the crushing plant in Decatur. 
worked in the alcohol plant in Peoria. That's when I realized those guys at ADM were geniuses because they were taking corn in Peoria and turning it into alcohol. Then they would load the alcohol onto these barges and send it down the Illinois River, which runs through Peoria, till it hit the Mississippi River. Then they'd ship it down the Mississippi River till it got to New Orleans. Then they'd float it across the Gulf and down to the Panama Canal, ship it across the, ca the canal, then across the Pacific to, to Japan. Once it was in Japan, they would flavor it. Then they would ship it again, return it to the port of Los Angeles and sell it to people in California as Japanese sake. And I was like, <laughs> wow. Anyways, they, they moved me eventually the Board of Trade and the Mercantile Exchange, which they, wa they wanted me to know how hedging worked and currencies and, and the exchanges themselves. And that was an unbelievable experience, particularly for some of the young people here. It was the open outcry pits in those days. And people were yell. You know, there were people making a million bucks a year just because they could elbow somebody else out of the pit or yell louder than they could. That was raw capitalism. There was one other guy in the program with me. He was older and he was heavier and he was bald and he, he didn't look so good. And the first day he walked into the office at ADM at the Board of Trade building, somebody looked up and said, oh my God, Uncle Fester is here. Because the guy looked like a character on television called Fester. And Nobody in that office ever learned the guy's real name. For the next 18 months, maybe two years, they just called him Fester. They would say, hey, Fester Kennedy, can you input the company orders today? Will you return the calls? Whatever. They never learned this guy's name. It was so rude and so stupid because Fester was an undercover FBI agent. <laughs> and he indicts everybody who calls him Fester. And then they all go to jail. Like 30 traders on the Board of Trade, the Mercantile Exchange, go to jail in 87, 88. It was unbelievable. And I think, my God, they play hard in Chicago. And everybody here is wearing a wire. So I left ADM and I came to the Merchandise Mart. And I stayed here for about 25 years. I ran the place for most of that time. The Mart's a really interesting building. You see a lot of it on this floor. When I was running, there were about 600 tra uh, showrooms in this building, about four or 500 in the apparel mart across the way. We ended up buying marts all over the United States, and the game was really to try to bring to the building the types of clients and customers the showrooms wanted to see. And the more of those customers we could get through, the happier the tenants were and the easier it was to keep the building leased up. We were sort of like in the trade show business. Then we realized we were really in the trade show business. And then we bought trade shows and started our own. And I eventually ran 90 different trade shows all across the United States, about 30 vertical markets. Everything from ceiling systems and architectural systems like, like this that we installed here, flooring, carpet tile, all of that, bridal gowns, men's wear. I ran the biggest bridal gown trade show in the United States. I don't know that much about bridal gowns, but. More, more than most people, I suppose. And, and contemporary art, and antiques, just about every part of the economy. And I started to see how government could help an economy or government decisions could hurt it, even if it was unintentional. During that period, more companies moved to Illinois to open an office for the first time at the Merchandise Mart Center than any other location in the state. There was no second place that I ever knew of. I know what it takes to get companies to move here and to expand once they arrive. And I love that. The thing is, I have four kids, Kate, Chris, Sarah, and Claire. Kate's a, she's getting a JD MBA over at Northwestern. Chris is a consultant. Sarah's in uh, Teach for America, teaches at the Earl School in Englewood. And Claire is a freshman in college. You all, many of you are around their age or maybe a little older. Our kids are about to make a decision about where they're going to live the rest of their lives. Where will they put down their roots? Where will they decide to live? I want them to stay here. I want to be around my grandchildren. And I want them to be around me as I get older. But I think about my older friends and their kids who are a little older than mine and what have they done. And I know that we have the largest outmigration of millennial generation of every state in the United States with the exception of New Jersey. Who the hell wants to live in New Jersey? <laughs> the really disturbing thing is we have the largest out, net out migration of college freshmen of any state. Now, 
Chicago is the largest college town in America. That's what's saving us right now. That's why all these headquartered companies are coming here, because they want to be around these young people. But we have to ask ourselves, are the kids who are attending college in Chicago, are they our kids, or are they from somewhere else? That's a legitimate question. I have my doubts, because I know that maybe a year or two ago, there were 30 high schools in Chicago where the average ACT score was a 14 or a 15. You got a 14 or a 15 on the ACT, you're going to have a hell of a time going to college. 30 high schools. 87% of the kids who went to CPS went to schools that were so underfunded that they graduated not college ready, which means they needed remedial education before they could go to community college or university. Only 13% graduated college ready. Now that number's doubled to 26% in the last year or two. You know how they did that? They changed the test. They converted from the ACT, which was a four-part test. Now there's a two-part test, and it doubled the number of kids who are college ready. That's what's happening here. In the rest of the state, almost the same thing. 75% of the kids who graduate any high school in Illinois graduate, went to a school that's so underfunded that they cannot go to community college or university without remedial education. Now the problem with remedial education is that it's not available to most people. We have a lot of it around here, but if you're in a county in Illinois, and we have counties without a grocery store, we definitely have counties without a community college. You have no access to that remedial education. 75% of the kids are jammed. Why do we have these results and do they exist in other states in America? The answer is they don't really exist like they do in, in Illinois. They don't exist like that anywhere else. The question is why do we have those results? We have those results because we underfund our schools. We underfund our schools because we pay for our schools in Illinois with local property taxes. Almost no other state does it exactly like we do it. Most states pay for twice as much of the cost of school at the state level than we do. They pay for it with a graduated progressive income tax, which allows the wealthiest among us to pay their fair share. But we don't do that in Illinois. We pay for it with local property taxes. So why, why don't we switch? Democrats really believe that we should have a progressive income tax. But the Democrats in Illinois had a supermajority in the House, a supermajority in the State Senate, controlled the governor's mansion, and did nothing to move us towards a graduated income tax. So why didn't we do anything? We didn't do anything because a handful of elected officials have side jobs as property tax appeals lawyers. They're making money on this system. And they don't want us to migrate to another system that they can't make money on. How much money do they make? Well, let me give you an example. There are two buildings, just two. The Sears Tower and 300 North LaSalle. You know where Chicago Cut is? That building on LaSalle Street, parallel to Mart? That, that's called 300 North LaSalle. Those two buildings, if they were assessed for what they sold for recently, they'd be assessed for a combined billion dollars more than they're assessed for. That means that those two buildings are robbing us of $50 million a year in property tax revenue. $50 million a year. That's a million dollars award that's not flowing into the public schools. A million dollars award that's not flowing into community policing. That's just from two of the buildings. Think of the hundreds of other buildings who have hired politically connected lawyers. Now, the lawyer who represents that building wants a third of the savings. That's what they argue for. Property tax appeals lawyers argue for a third of the savings. A third of 50 million is about 17 million dollars. That's what they want as a fee for doing that. But they want it for the three years of the triennial reassessment. They want the full 50 million dollars. And they're getting it from buildings across Illinois and particularly in Chicago. The guy with the largest property tax appeals business in Cook County is Speaker Madigan, Mike Madigan. 
That's why we're not moving to a progressive income tax. That's why we're allowing this crushing economy to destroy the lives, doom the next generation to a life of economic servitude. Because he controls the House and nobody will move legislation to move us to a progressive income tax. So Madigan, he's the Speaker of the House, but he's also the head of the Democratic Party in the state. That means he gets to choose the head of the Democratic Party in Cook County. So he did. That guy's name is Joe Berrios. Then Joe Berrios gets to slate pick the people who are going to run for office. And he slated himself as the Cook County Assessor. So Madigan's appealing property tax appeals to Joe Berrios, who he chose for that job. That's what's going on. I believe that's a disaster for the future of our state. When I graduated from high school and college, my friends and I, we moved to where the jobs were. Today, that's not the way the American economy works. Today, the jobs move to where the highly educated kids are. If we give the world highly educated kids, the world will give us its jobs. That's the way it works. If you wanted to reinvent the Illinois economy and say, well, okay, I'm going to shut my eyes. I will switch our economy for any one of these five. What would those five be? Probably Silicon Valley, Austin, Texas, Research Triangle, North Carolina, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, around Carnegie Mellon, maybe Boston. We might even take Akron, Ohio. Akron, Ohio is an amazing city. There are more people involved. There are more people involved in the polymer industry in Akron, Ohio than ever worked at all of the factories making tires when Akron was the tire capital of the world. Now the reason those economies work is the same reason the economy works in Boston. I saw that up close. In Boston, my uncle Ted Kennedy and Tip O'Neill and John Kerry would go to Washington. They'd bring home federal government research grants for places like Mass General or UMass, MIT, Harvard, Brandeis, Tufts, all those schools there. And the professors, they'd investigate basic research. And that research would slough off applied research. And people would invest in those ideas. And they'd start little companies that employed people who paid local taxes, that funded schools, and educated a whole new generation ready to begin that reinvention again and again. It's like perpetual job creation. The alumni of MIT alone have started 30 thousand companies. They employ four and a half million people. It's great to think about bringing Amazon here. It's great to think about bringing companies to Chicago. But what we really want is something like MIT. And we already have something that's bigger and in my opinion better, the University of Illinois. And all we have to do is fund our public colleges and universities and reinvest in the private ones and create a collaborative sense that allows them all to thrive. We can rebuild the economy of the state simply by investing in higher educational research institutions and mimic the great outcomes that have occurred in all of those other parts of our country. We could have one solution for everybody in our state. We can, we can give them highly educated outcomes that allow the jobs to return to our state everywhere. And that's what I want to do. But we need to fix the pipeline of kids. We need to fix grade school and high school and early childhood access and give kids an equal chance. And the only way to do that is to move to a progressive income tax. We're never going to be able to do that if these guys don't give up. What they're doing is not illegal. What they're doing should be illegal. I think we should ban elected officials from having outside jobs that are adverse to the interest of the body they were elected to serve, which is fancy language for we should ban elected officials from being property tax appeals lawyers. I can't do that alone. I need your help. I need you to ask elected officials if they'll sign a ban, they'll sign a pledge agreeing to vote for a ban on other elected officials being property tax appeals lawyers. And my belief is that you can go to our website, download that <coughs> pledge, and next time a state rep or state senator comes to your community, raise your hand, ask them if they'll sign the ban. And when you do that, pull out your, your iPhone and film their answer, and then post it on Facebook. They may be scared of Speaker Madigan, but they're terrified of the voter. 
And if you do that often enough, you can restore democracy in our state. This is a big issue for all of us. What happens to the future of our economy? I go to this parking garage over here. When I come in, they read my license plate. They know it's my car. When I leave, it reads my license plate, knows my car. I can fly in and out of there. There used to be a guy who took the ticket and exchanged the cash. That guy's gone. He's been disintermediated. For me, I ended up with a much better experience. It's faster and it's cheaper. For him, it didn't work out so well. Technology is great if it makes your life easier, gives you more free time, makes things cheaper, more available. It can improve every aspect of our lives. And at the University of Illinois, where I was chairman of the board for five years, we have these GPS machines that can measure the soil quality and the amount of water and disperse seed and nitrogen into the ground. And it can adjust every few meters. It's unbelievable. It's allowing us to feed a world that 25, 30 years ago, we never could have been as productive as we need to be now. I see the benefits of technology, but if we, if we disintermediate people fast enough, if we leave them behind in this economy, what are they gonna do? Eventually, if too many of them are disintermediate, if they lose their jobs, well, they're gonna go a political route. They're gonna elect officials, populists, who protect them and who pass laws banning driverless cars. They'll figure that out. And, and then that technology, it, it won't, it won't cease to be developed. It'll just cease to be developed here. Other communities who figure out a more humane way to deal with everybody in their community, they'll figure out a way to allow that to occur. And that development will occur somewhere else. And then their economies will grow faster than ours. Then we'll have a brain drain and all the smart people will move there. And then we're doomed. So the question is, who's responsible? for the disruption of technology. Is there a free market solution that's coming? Is capitalism gonna supply the answer? Or is that government's role? That's the fundamental issue of our lives. Whose job is it? And how are we gonna solve that problem? Today, our response is simply to push the poor out of the state of Illinois. That sounds like a wild thing, but here's the proof. The state of Illinois, our economy shrunk and has been shrinking. And yet at the same time, this is nearly impossible to have a shrinking economy and at the same time have rising average household income. Average household income jumped 11% even as the economy shrunk. How do you do that? That's nearly impossible. The only way to do that is to cut off funding for 800 social service agencies so that anybody with a sick child, a disabled brother or sister, elderly parents who need home health care, really need it, they had to leave the state in order to make sure that they could take care of their families. And when the poor left the state, it made the rest of us who remained behind look, on average, 11% wealthier. That's what's going on in our community. I don't think that's a great strategy. I don't think that's a winner of a plan. I think that's a burden that falls on all of us. I think we need to figure out a way to bring everybody along. And I don't know whether that's a government job. I don't know whether it's industry. I don't know whether it's up to you, but I do know if we don't solve that problem, we will have a disaster on our hands. The thing about the millennials, somebody, quoted me in the paper about how Chicago's becoming smaller and it's becoming whiter. That's true. That's occurring. I don't believe the millennial generation wants that. I don't think they're looking for suburbia in the urban core. I think more than anything else, they have a passion and an empathy in them that is lacking in the two previous generations. They want to deal with the large problems of the day. They want to understand how do we affect housing and hunger and health care? 
How do we have access to transportation? How do we reinvent our economy so it works for everyone? That's what they want. And the fact is that all of you are here tonight working collectively. That is something that did not occur in previous generations. And its presence is here now, and we need to take advantage of it. If we do, my belief is we can give our kids good jobs. We can give them long careers. We can keep them close to home. We can keep the promise of this country, and we can, at least in Illinois, once more, make the American dream the dream for all Americans. And that's why I'm running for governor, and that's why I'd like your help. Thank you all very much. Right. So first question, um, I know you signed the Open Data Pledge. Uh, could you talk about how you would approach Open Data and FOIA to assure that information is released without regard to whether it reflected well or poorly on your administration or the state? Um, you know, I was chairman of the board of the University of Illinois for five years. So we had uh, six meetings a year, maybe a retreat as well. So there were 30 meetings a year. And I was trying to find the, we, we'd, at one point we'd voted to um, increase minority participation in construction projects. But I was trying to find that vote. Because I was trying to remind myself of the specific percentage that we had developed for Chicago, for Springfield, and for Ch Champaign-Urbana. And so I called my friends in the board office that handle all of that, and they said, well, now you're a candidate, you have to file a FOIA request. It's like, come on, you know exactly where the thing is. They're like, that's the law now. And, and it was a great eye-opener for me of how those bureaucratic rules just get in the way of open communication. I don't think there's any decision I made at the board of the, or that we made at the board of the University of Illinois that would have been better made had I made it myself. I believe in collective wisdom. I believe the faster we can get data out, the more we can share, the quicker we do it, the better off we all are. I think responding to FOIA requests is the tip of the iceberg. I also think the state of Illinois is woefully behind in any form of technology. They have computers that are so old, they don't think they can get the hard drives replaced, and they're afraid of losing all their historic data. So how do they fund all of that? I think there's great models in other cities and other states where they've allowed people to come in and rebuild their systems and have access to the data sets, and that their use of those data sets, not private information, but analysis and insight into how our civil life works allows them to self-fund government reinvention. And I think there are models that we can use from other cities and other states. If we adopt them here in Illinois, we can fix our government's functionality and in the process we can embrace the very disclosure, that openness that I think is the future and hallmark of great governance. Uh, pensions now account for 25% of the state's budget, $170 billion in unfunded liability uh, won't be fixed by increasing taxes alone. How are you intending to close the unfunded liability gap that is crippling the economy? So the pension uh, problem in Illinois, I think, is super manageable. Super manageable. And, and I think the city of Chicago provided us a really good roadmap. The fact is the, the pensions in Chicago were woefully underfunded and Rahm Emanuel figured out a way to work with the major unions and create a program that allowed them to, I think, refinance some of the debt or the outstanding uh, uh, obligations to extend the ramp, the period during which the city is obliged to become, I think, 80% funded and to uh, work with the unions on some limited benefit adjustments. He went to the legislature, he got permission to do all of those things last January, a year ago. And it was a great move, and everybody was in favor of it, Democrats and Republicans, and then in a surprise move on the 58th of 60 days during which you can veto a bill, Governor Rauner, Governor Rauner vetoed it on a Friday night. It was reported that veto was in the Tribune on Saturday mornings, page six. You should always read the Saturday paper. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's where all the good stuff is, because they expect nobody to read it. And he didn't do it because it was fiscally unsound. He didn't 
veto it because it was bad for the economy. He didn't veto it because it was bad for the city. He didn't veto it because it didn't have bipartisan support. He vetoed it so he'd have an election year issue, so he could say to the rest of the state, I'm going to keep you from protected from Rahm Emanuel's overreach. That's not what was going on. But what did go on is we had a solution for the pensions in Chicago, and we can use that same model for the state of Illinois. Give us a little bit more time to, to um, reach the, the fully funded mark, put a little more money in now, refinance some of the outstanding debt, and it's all manageable. We don't need to raise our taxes and overburden the economy. Governor Rauner hasn't tried to do any of those things. I don't think he wanted to, but that's a different story. If you want me to tell it, somebody's got to ask it. Next question is, instead of steamrolling and alienating those that disagree with us, how can we make bipartisan and compromise sexist? <laughs> Elect me, baby. Um, <laughs> the, people ask me what kind of... Uh, candidate I am, what kind of politician I am. I, and I say, I'm a, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Kennedy Democrat. Ted Kennedy was the most important man in my life, and he's a great role model. He was one of the most progressive and liberal members of the United States Senate. Almost every great piece of legislation from 1962 to 2009 had his fingerprints on it. Even though he was one of the most progressive members of the Senate, he always had friends across the aisle, and he worked hard at it. He never took it personally. They would go on the Senate floor, the Republicans would, and rail about Ted Kennedy. And then he'd meet him back in the cloakroom, have a laugh with him, put his arm around him, and then they'd work together on something they had common interest in. I don't believe that compromise is surrender. I grew up in a time when there was great bipartisan support, and that's my model, and I intend to embrace it. What about your beliefs is different from your opponents? Well, I think the, the major issue is, in my opinion, for all of us, is, is the education of the next generation of kids in the state of Illinois. If we don't fix that problem, I believe our economy is doomed. That's what I think. I think the reason we have a challenging educational system in Illinois is because we rely on property taxes. I believe we rely on property taxes because the head of the Democratic Party makes money on that system and is preventing us from moving to a progressive income tax. I think Joe Barrio shouldn't be the assessor of Cook County. I think what he's doing is outrageous. I think if you look at African American communities, if you look at communities and wards, they're incredibly overassessed. You go to Robbins, you look at the last 20 houses, any of you can do this. And this would be a great service to everybody in our state. Peter's been working on a program within the campaign to help aggregate data. It's nearly impossible to do. But you could go, you could go into an African American town like Robbins, look at the last 20 houses that's sold by going on realtor.com, get their address, go on the Cook County Assessor's website, look at the sales price, compare the two, and you'll see that on average they were overassessed relative to market value by 187%. You go to Harvey, it's probably 244%. You go to African American wards, 6th ward, 9th ward, 34th ward, you might have 200, 300, 400% on average overassessment. And the Sears Tower sells for a billion, two hundred million dollars. It gets a billion dollar mortgage on it to pay for the billion two. Both are recorded at Cook County Recorder of Deeds. And yet Joe Barrio says, oh no, 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 no. Sales price doesn't matter. It's really worth five hundred and seventy nine million dollars. Which means there's six hundred million dollars missing from that one building. The building pays five percent in real estate taxes. Five percent of six hundred million is 30 million. That's real money. And all those towns, all those houses are overassessed, and people are leaving, losing their homes to tax sales left and right. And we're allowing 
places like the Sears Tower, 300 North LaSalle, or almost any building in the downtown core to, to be assessed at woefully undervalued numbers that transfer that tax burden from the commercial properties to the residences such that people are losing their homes and we're unable to fund our schools. That's what's going on. J.B. Pritzker was brought in to protect that system. When I started looking at these numbers, I went to people and they said, you cannot talk about that during the campaign. You cannot talk about that during the campaign. These were people who worked for our senior elected officials in the state. Put that document away. Don't show it to another person. I was like, okay, well, that's not gonna happen. <laughs> I had this one guy who's older than me, he almost took a swing at me at Chicago Cup. We were at breakfast, I was like, look, I, geez, I don't understand this, but it looks like, I mean, just the way I see it, looks like the black wards are over assessed the white wards. And, and he, he went in and I moved away, so he didn't swing, but he grabbed the paper from me and he took it like he was gonna keep it, which he did. Like somehow I typed it and it was my only copy. And, and I was like, wow. Things are moving beyond you guys. You need to give up and, and, and let a new generation thrive. But Pritzker was brought in to defend those people. He will not criticize Joe Berrios. He made calls from Joe Berrios' office for his own campaign for weeks. And he's tied to that system. There's no way he can bring the change that we need in this state. Cardinal Supich, the head of the Catholic Church in Chicago, was interviewed in the papers last summer. And he said, in a, in a democracy, people get the government they deserve. I don't think we deserve this government. It's time for a change. The next question is, what type of legislation would you propose to address racial injustice, specifically in the realm of criminal justice? Um, I mean, there, there's, there, there are so many parts of the criminal justice system that are broken, it's hard to know where to begin. We have in the United States criminalized poverty. We've criminalized race. We've criminalized poverty to a degree where the judge who sets your bail determines your sentence. So many people sit in jail, that's pre-adjudication. After you get sentenced, you go to prison. Before you get, go to, you get sentenced, you sit in jail. If you can't make bail, you, you probably lose your job because you miss so many days. You probably lose your car because you can't make a car payment because you, you lost your job. You sit there and then your case is called, the judge tries you and they'll sentence you to time served. That occurs over and over across the United States and across Illinois. We should get rid of cash bail. It has no bearing on anything that we do. Either, either someone's dangerous or they're not. The dangerous ones shouldn't be let out. The ones who aren't dangerous should be let out. Like, why, why attach a price to that? There's, there's no study that shows us why we do that. We know that we've criminalized race. We know that the police officer who pulls you over is likely to assume that you're more guilty if you're African American than if you're white. Even if that police officer is African American. We know that the judge who sentences or finds you guilty or frees you is more likely to find you guilty if you're African American than if you're white. We know that the duration of your sentences can be longer if you're African American than if you're white. We know all of that is true. We know that we house people for days, weeks, months, years, and we have no view, collective view, of why we're doing that. Are we punishing people? Is it retribution? Is it restoration? Are we reforming them? Are we preparing them for re-entry? What's the goal? In a group this big of such well-educated people, we should all say, yeah, we're on the same page. We're doing this, this, and that. There's no understanding of why we put people in jail. And there are definitely people who should be in jail. But we need to rethink the entire system. And it, it starts with an open discussion about race and poverty 
and the outcomes that we want for society. So for our last question, uh, what is your stance on helping uh, people with disabilities on jobs and education, especially since our unemployment rate is high? Um, so, so Chicago is a great place. Illinois is a great place. I love so many aspects of this state. The best bike ride I've ever taken is on the lakefront. The, I've never been on a safari in Africa, but the coolest oak savanna that there is, it's breathtaking up in Lake County along the Des Plaines River Trail. The most dangerous ski run I've ever taken was Chestnut Mountain in, in Galena, Illinois, and if you come in hot at the lift line at the end and miss it, you end up in the Mississippi River. <laughs> Today, our, our, our companies, they dominate world markets. Our, exchange, our farmland exports all over the world. We jam port cities from Rotterdam to Osaka with the, with the products of our heartland. Our exchanges like the SIBO and the Merck dominate the world markets. But the greatest export we ever sent from Illinois to the rest of the world is Special Olympics, 100%. When it arrived in places like India, China, South America, and Africa, it allowed millions of people to continue to live because they saw that kids could participate, young people could participate in sports, and then they allowed them to, well, take care of themselves, maybe move out of group homes into individual homes. Maybe they could participate not only in sports, but in jobs and careers. We invented a notion of reinventing how we deal with our disabled brothers and sisters. And not just intellectual disabilities, but disabilities of all kind, because the lessons we learn there spread to the rest of our lives. The single greatest rehabilitation institute anywhere in the world is located in Chicago, Physical Rehabilitation, the RIC. The, the greatest advocacy organization for employment for people with disabilities is, is located in Chicago, run by a woman named Marika Bristow. That's how we should brand ourselves. That's who we should be. When people think of Chicago, they should think of the greatest city in the world for people with developmental disabilities or physical disabilities. That's who we should be, but we're not. We're attacking the very people that we should be most proud of in our grade schools, in our high schools, and throughout our work environment as well. And it doesn't have to be like that. There are great things that we can do, and that is who we should be to the rest of the world. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you all.